Good afternoon, good day. For those of you that don't know me, my name is George Ann Diniaco, and I am honored to be with you this afternoon. I am grateful that it's pouring down rain out there because you are maybe more present in a different way today than dreaming about being outside on a gorgeous day. So I am grateful for that. Uh, we have a, an opportunity for us to be able to get through some things tonight. When you walk away from here, we want you to really understand a couple of different things. We want to make sure that we're all on the same page. I know, as I've said in the past, how many of you first time ever been here? First time. Welcome to the Dublin family. Welcome to uh, the opportunity to continue to make an impact on our young people. We appreciate your presence. How many of you have been here for five years? 10, 20, 30, 40? Just checking. For those of you that have been here a number of years, what you have to say and what you do every single day makes a impact on our young people, whether it's on the field, on, in your clubs, in your classroom, wherever it may be. I don't want you to think that we do not appreciate what it is that you do. I know, just like myself, this is a requirement to be here. I get that. So with that being said, we want this to be meaningful to you. We want you to walk away from here with some insights and an understanding, even if you've heard it 5, 10, 15 times. Each and every year we try to add a little bit and change it up a little bit and we try to make sure that when you walk away, it's meaningful. This is what we hope to accomplish today. We will, as always, we're required to make sure to go over some medical updates. So we have our medical team that will go over a few things with us. Mr. McDonald is here from Central Office to share with us some of our Central Office insights and we appreciate the fact that, that he's here. We have some students that are here tonight that are gonna share some insights from their perspective and talk with you a little bit about what, um, what they see and what they hear and you have the opportunity to ask them some questions. We'll talk with you a little bit more about that. Ways to be able to keep our young people safe, review the code and respond to any questions that you might have. Okay, so with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to our medical team and have Kim start it off and share with you Hi guys, thanks for being here. I'm Becky Ansari, this is Kim Atherton. We're two of the six district nurses, so we each have multiple buildings, but all of you are represented by one of us. So if you don't yet know who your nurse is, you can find that out pretty simply. Um, they're pretty impor important people to know who they are just for your multitude of, of medical needs represented by your students. So that's why we're here. We want to be a team member with you to keep them safe. That is our purpose, and we know that's what you guys want too, as well as shaping them into athletes and other things like that. So um, a couple things we'll talk about tonight. Your EMAs, your emergency medical authorizations, I think are on final forms now, so you don't have to find those, but make sure you have those. Those have a lot of good information on them, and the only way a lot of you will know about your, your, children, your athletes' medical concerns or issues or potential um, issues is by looking through those. You, knowledge is power. You really need to know what, what you could face during a season so that you can be prepared um, for those things. And then if you find something that you are concerned about, don't want to go straight to your athlete or parents, come and talk to one of us because we have these students too. So we know about their concerns also. Um, but then your other good resource for most of these um, issues, seizures, diabetics, um, allergies, uh, things like that are going to be your students. Just ask them. Just say, what, tell me what it looks like if you're low, if you're a diabetic. Tell me what it looks like, you know, if you're, um, have you, ha have you ha ever had to use your, an allergy um, rescue? Just things like that. Just be informed. And then the other thing is to know where, if they have emergency meds, to know where they keep those when they're with you. Because if you don't know where they are, they are no good to them and they are no good to you. So just make sure you're informed to keep the kids safe. Um, a lot of the kids are okay talking about it in front of teammates, but that is not your choice to make. So make sure if you're going to ask them about it, do that privately um, the first time and then let them make that decision from there. Um, we ha there are a lot of kids with EPIs that are in their 
sporting events. There are also now a lot of Avi cues out back on the market. So we train you with these because we don't have an abundance of Avi cue trainers, but fortunately they are very um, user friendly. They talk you through the whole steps. So I'll, I, I will show you that momentarily. Um, but we are going to practice the EpiPen together. Um, these are for anaphylaxis related to some sort of allergy. Uh, obviously, foods are the most common, but there are things like um, bees. Some of you may, in your sporting seasons, may come across things like that. Just, you just need to know. Signs of anaphylaxis are also different for everybody. There's not a textbook that says, here's what, exactly what's going to happen in these steps. Some people have facial swelling. Some people just immediately have the, you know, the tongue and the throat swelling and the closing. Some people have hives. Um, so it represents differently in different people. But, but it's an emergency, and it, you need to respond quickly to it. For all emergency meds, if you are giving them, you are asking somebody else to call 911. Every emergency med goes with a 911 call because most of them will require additional emergency meds once these, these act fast, but they wear off fast too. Okay, so you're, if you're giving it, you're assigning somebody to call 911, you are staying with your, child, well, your student, your athlete, until um, emergency responders arrive. Okay? So we'll go over these together. We'll practice together. You can practice on yourself or your neighbor's chest or whatever. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. So um, these are held like a dagger with the blue to the sky. Do not put your thumb on either end. In the heat of the moment, giving it to yourself, again, doesn't do you any good and doesn't do the child that needs it any good. So keeping your thumb off of both ends will at least prevent that. You'll take, the blue goes up, you'll pop that off. You will feel the thigh. You don't have to stab the thigh, but you do put it through clothes, not through anything, wallets, cell phones, any of that. Make sure the thigh is clear. And you'll give it an injection, one, two, three. A lot of these say 10 seconds still. The, um, the direction's actually on the current um, EpiPens, say three, that the med is administered. But the directions are on all the different versions. There's Adrenoclix, there's generic versions of these, there's the AviQs, Avi there's these. They all have the directions right on them if you are feeling nervous, okay? So you'll hold this up. This, this child, by the time they're going to need this, is down, you know, laying down, okay? So you'll, you'll be down with them. You'll feel the thigh, the blue to the sky. Oh, yeah, sorry. To, re, to practice again, give it that squeeze um, if you don't have your arm in a... You got yours? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it takes two. To re-put that in, put that blue top in, and we'll practice it one more time while Kim walks around. Just want you to feel comfortable with these. So you'll hold it like a dagger. You'll take the blue off. You'll feel the thigh first, and then give it a nice, make sure it pops. Okay? So again, these act really quickly for a child in anaphylaxis, or a person in anaphylaxis, but they typically will need another one, you know, in five to seven minutes. These come in two packs. We ask for two packs. We don't ask for them to split up one at home and one at school or one at sports and one at school. So you'll typically have the whole pack of two. They may need another one before the squad arrives, depending on where you are. So if you see signs and symptoms returning, you can give the second one. Okay? The AviQ is, is, this, is similar, but it talks to you. So you will just pull it apart. This trainer contains no needle or drug. The real one won't say that. <laughs> okay, and then if you are ready to use, pull off red safety to inject. Place black end against outside, then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Five, four, okay. three. So it talks you through it. One. It is very, very user friendly. Injection well, de well designed. Okay, so there are a lot of those. Just know what your what your children have. Used for training purposes. <coughs> okay, you are, uh, I'm sorry, there's no questions. <laughs> <laughs>
be as easy to get through those. So we told them to kind of pull it down. I don't know if that would affect anybody else a little bit. I mean, it will go through the jeans or pants, anything like that. But if you've got any kind of thickness, it might be a little more difficult to get it in and where it needs to be. It's true. It is a big, big needle. But I, you err on the side of caution if you can get a layer off. Yeah, for sure. It is a not fun needle, but it, it, it is better than the, than the alternative. But um, yeah, I mean, if you can get a layer off if you have that much padding, absolutely. Good question. Sorry. Are there any other questions based on allergies? Should I stop moving? <laughs> I didn't even notice. You're like, allergies, anaphylaxis, things like that. Yes, ma'am. No, I, I was joking. No, you need to know. So that's what I'm saying is you need to know your kit. You should have emergency medical forms for all. Oh, oh okay. And yeah. Then have a kit that's yeah. Great. Great. That's possible. Because if they're self-caring, then they self-caring. But their medical forms will should still say that. Final forms is very exhaustive. They ask a lot of questions. Really? Filled it out for my own child. So it's possible that you have not had life-threatening allergies that our kids are carried. And if but, do have someone who self carries it's really important that you make sure you know where they're keeping that when they come like I my first year here in Dublin I had a kid nowhere on medical forms did it say anything but she had a peanut allergy and she took a handful of stuff and shoved it in her mouth that all the kids were eating and then she like realized took off running and spit it out and, and my my immediate way do you have a peanut allergy just you know and she was like yeah I'm like oh my gosh where's your EpiPen why isn't it on the EMA because like I had no idea so I was in a really bad situation had something happened to her and I didn't have that available to me at the time. You know, um, her parents were there, thank goodness, who had another EpiPen, but it, it happens very quickly. Some people, it's, you know, seconds, some people, it's, you know, a couple minutes. But with that being said, just because they're a self-carry doesn't mean that you don't make sure you know where they're keeping that at at all times. So you don't want to count on something that may not be there. Yeah, like I said, you need, yes, if you know your child has an emergency medicine, you need to know where it is when they are with you because it doesn't do anybody any good if you don't know where it is and they need it because they won't be able to help themselves. So if you have um, diabetics, some of them will have a gel or something if they go low, a gel. Some of them will have an injectable glucose, probably not very many of them on the athletic fields, but most of them will have like a gel or, or glucose tabs. You need to know where those are because especially in athletics, Kids can drop very quickly. Um, you may have some seizure meds. I don't know if you have any athletes with seizure meds, but you should, you should know this. And we are so happy. If you find something on one of your forms that freaks you out, please come and find us. We would love to make you comfortable, as comfortable as you can be. Um, any other questions about that information? Uh, you're going to, oh, you need to know where your Narcans are. They're where your AEDs are, and you need to know where those are, too. The closest one to wherever you are practicing or, or working out or your sport is, you need to m make sure that's something you know. I think you have to put that on something somewhere, but these are with them. The Narcans are with the AEDs. Um, a single dose is in the uh, athletic wing AED side pockets. Again. A single dose of Narcan may or may not help somebody very much, but it might buy them the time until an re emergency responder gets here. So these are the single dose um, dispensers that are in the AEDs. It's just a nasal spray. You'll see about them um, on here. So just make sure you're aware of where these are. God forbid if we would need to use them. So We're going to show the uh, video. I. I want to make sure that the back row, if you can hear it or not hear it when we turn it on, just let us know. This is the Narcan video. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information concerning its use. Please see indications and important safety information at the end of this video. Also, please see accompanying full prescribing information in the use of this product. Narcan nasal spray is an emergency treatment for a known or suspected opioid overdose. The appropriate use of Narcan nasal spray can help you save a life. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. 
As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information concerning its use. If you encounter someone who is unresponsive and you suspect an overdose, first shake their shoulders and shout their name. Kevin. Ask if he or she is okay. Hey, can you hear me? Check for signs of an overdose, unresponsive to touch or voice. Breathing is slow, uneven, or has stopped. <sighs> Snoring, gasping, or gurgling sounds. Fingernails or lips are blue or purple. Administer Narcan nasal spray as quickly as possible if someone is unresponsive and an opioid overdose is suspected, even when in doubt, because prolonged respiratory depression may result in damage to the central nervous system or even death. Lay the person on their back to receive a dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove Narcan nasal spray from the box. Peel back the tab with the circle to open it. Remove and review the printed quick start guide inside the package. Hold the Narcan nasal spray with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and your first and middle fingers on either side of the nozzle. Do not press the plunger to test or prime the device. If you do, you will waste all or part of the dose of medication. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under the neck with your hand. Gently insert the tip of the nozzle into one nostril until your fingers on either side of the nozzle are against the person's nose. Press the plunger firmly to give the full dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove the device from the nostril after giving the dose. After you have given this medication, seek emergency help right away. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. I'm with somebody who stopped breathing. I, I think they've had an overdose. Move the person on their side after giving Narcan nasal spray. If possible, put their hands under their head and bend their upper leg forward. This helps prevent the person from rolling onto their stomach. This is known as the recovery position. Continue to watch the person closely. If they do not wake up or respond to your voice or touch, or if they do not seem to be breathing normally within two to three minutes, use a new Narcan nasal spray to give an additional dose in the other nostril. Acute opiate withdrawal symptoms may occur from use of Narcan nasal spray in patients who are opioid dependent. Symptoms include body aches, diarrhea, increased heart rate or tachycardia, fever, runny nose, sneezing, goosebumps, also known as piloerection, sweating, yawning, nausea or vomiting, nervousness, restlessness or irritability, shivering or trembling, abdominal cramps, weakness and increased blood pressure. When the emergency is over, put the Narcan nasal spray back in its box and throw it away in a place that is away from the reach of children. In addition to watching this video, please read the quick start guide that comes with Narcan nasal spray before using it. Talk to a healthcare professional if you have any questions about how to administer Narcan nasal spray. Please read the indications and important safety information that follows. Store Narcan nasal spray at room temperature between 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 to 25 degrees centigrade. Do not freeze Narcan nasal spray. Keep Narcan nasal spray in the box until ready to use. Protect from light. Replace Narcan nasal spray before the expiration date on the box. Keep Narcan nasal spray and all medicines out of the reach of children. Indications. Narcan naloxone hydrochloride nasal spray is an opioid antagonist indicated for the emergency treatment of known or suspected opioid overdose as manifested by respiratory and or central nervous system depression. Narcan nasal spray is intended for immediate administration as emergency therapy in settings where opioids may be present. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. Important safety information. Narcan nasal spray is contraindicated in patients known to be hypersensitive to naloxone hydrochloride. Seek emergency medical assistance immediately after initial use, keeping the patient under continued surveillance. Risk of recurrent respiratory and CNS depression. Due to the duration of action of naloxone relative to the opioid, keep the patient under continued surveillance and administer repeat doses of naloxone using a new nasal spray with each dose as necessary while awaiting emergency medical assistance. Risk of limited efficacy with partial agonists or mixed agonist antagonists. Reversal of respiratory depression caused by partial agonists or mixed agonists antagonists such as buprenorphine and pentazazine may be incomplete. Larger or repeat doses may be required. Precipitation of severe opioid withdrawal. 
Use in patients who are opioid dependent may precipitate opioid withdrawal, characterized by body aches, diarrhea, increased heart rate, tachycardia, fever, runny nose, sneezing, goosebumps, piloerection, sweating, yawning, nausea or vomiting, nervousness, restlessness or irritability, shivering or trembling, abdominal cramps, weakness, and increased blood pressure. In neonates, opioid withdrawal may be life-threatening if not recognized and properly treated and may be characterized by convulsions, excessive crying, and hyperactive reflexes. Monitor for the development of opioid withdrawal. Risk of cardiovascular CV, effects. Abrupt postoperative reversal of opioid depression may result in adverse CV effects. These events have primarily occurred in patients who had pre-existing CV disorders or received other drugs that may have similar adverse CV effects. Monitor these patients closely in an appropriate healthcare setting after use of naloxone hydrochloride. The following adverse reactions were observed in a Narcan nasal spray clinical study. Increased blood pressure, musculoskeletal pain, headache, nasal dryness, nasal edema, nasal congestion, and nasal inflammation. See instructions for use and full prescribing information in the use of this product. To report suspected adverse reactions, contact Adapt Pharma Inc. at 1-844-4-NARCAN, 1-844-462-7226, or the FDA at 1-800-FDA-1088, or www.fda.gov slash medwatch. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom McDonald. I'm the Director of Student Operations. I know uh, a number of you, most of you, were here last year, but I, I want to just tell you a little bit about what I do here in the district and, and why I think this meeting is very important. So, um, Director of Student Operations, I oversee our enrollment center, work with our SROs, student safety, school safety, um, athletics. So, athletic directors, I work closely with our athletic directors. Uh, I oversee the four middle schools, so I work directly with the middle school principals and, and a number of other things, uh, suspension, expulsion hearings, things like that, and, and the other duties as assigned by the superintendent. Um, I'm excited to be here because I started my career uh, 20 plus years ago, but uh, I was a coach at Scioto, I was a social studies teacher, and 20 years ago sat in this room, uh, Dr. D kind of uh, went through her piece, and, and I still remember the conversation at, at that meeting was talking about if you're a coach um, and you go out for a happy hour, do something, I, I want you to think about wearing the school uniform and, and to not do it. Um, and she just asked us to think about it, but I remember that was the topic of conversation with the coaches and, and a bunch of those things, and I thought over the 20 years, um, I've thought about that, that statement, and so a number of things, just that you, we work in a fishbowl, um, and I, I think of this meeting as, as you are our team, and so this is kind of like our, our locker room conversation. How many of you are uh, club advisors in the room? So uh, a number of you, and, and I think it's really important that, that you're here as well. And so, uh, again, when I started teaching, I was a assistant golf coach, uh, JV freshman lacrosse coach at Scioto, ski club advisor. Uh, was a head lacrosse coach at Jerome, and I was a building principal in Old Tangy for nine years, and then I've been back as my second year in this role. Uh, I think what you do is very important, and Dr. D started her presentation by saying, you know, we very much appreciate what you do, and so I want to say thank you, first and foremost, because I think a lot of the memories that our kids are going to take from, with them from school they're gonna remember their clubs and their athletics that they were part of and being with their friends and having a great time. So, you know, we talk about what the district hopes for all of you is that you have fun with our kids, that you're safe, that you teach them the game that you love or the club. Um, you know, as our schools keep getting bigger, I know for some of you, you've probably gone through all the winter sports. Have you already finished your, like, a cuts if you had to make them and making the teams? That's pretty much solidified, I would guess, at this point. Coach, are they pretty much set? So, you know, the, the clubs become that much more important the bigger our schools get because kids need a place to fit in, to be a part of something, to be a part of something great. Their parents care that they're a part of something. 
And if it can't be the basketball team because only five guys are on the floor at one time or a number of kids that can swim in a lane or any of those things, they need something. And they're concerned deeply that their, their child won't have something positive to connect with. So that's why the clubs are a, a very important piece, athletics as well. Um, there's a number of things on here, and I don't want you to feel like it's 50 ways to lose your job. I think it's just, this is our team, and if you, were to, if you were to hear this, I'd rather you hear it from me, and I'm not here to insult anyone's intelligence. You're all very good at what you do, but there are a couple wrinkles that we added last year for people to think about, and also um, this year from working with our trainers. So a couple things to, to consider. Um, student safety is our top priority. And we have a safety day coming up on Tuesday for those of you that are work and teach and classified employees in the, in the district. Um, over the, the last number of years, I mean, the importance of making sure that you don't put yourself into a bad position with the student so that if you're having conversations, you're not doing it behind closed doors where someone can't see you from the outside. So, and, you know, especially with a, a locker room scenario, you want to make sure that um, you're having those conversations with an assistant coach present, that the door is open. If it's a private conversation you don't want others to hear, you could do that in a more public place like the library, somewhere behind glass where people can see. Um, the, no direct texting, one-on-one -on -one, uh, students. Um, and, and I know that's probably the single toughest thing for people to kind of figure out because communication has changed a lot. Um, but you need to find a way to use a, a, an app or a number of coaches have found ways to do that. Um, having other coaches also on the string, but you don't want to get yourself into a position where someone can say that the coach, you know, sent me inappropriate pictures, kids, once they have your cell phone number. Um, there are a lot of things that, that they're smart enough to know how to do electronically. Um, so I, I think and also for yourself, I think you need, the biggest thing, you need to take care of yourself during this season. You can't take care of the kids if you, if you don't take care of yourself. Um, so someone having 24-7 access to you, I don't think is healthy for you personally. So um, something just to consider, and obviously if, uh, if you already have some of those things in place, you just need to figure out a way to communicate with, with students that's not just direct one-on-one -on -one, uh, texting. Uh, same thing goes for just giving kids a ride home. I mean, it used to be that when you, you saw somebody walking home, you could give them a ride home, you know, in the pouring rain, give them a ride. Um, I would never put yourself in that position uh, because you then, the onus would be on you to defend that you didn't do something inappropriate if an accusation was made. So, again, uh, just taking care of yourself and thinking about those things. Um, don't touch the money. And I would, you know, if you have to collect the pay to participate and turn that into the AD, AD secretary, that's one thing. Um, that's part of, you know, what we're doing. But fundraising money, I would have your boosters touch all that. I would not touch the money because that sometimes gets people into trouble. You have to, you know, explain there's money that there's missing or we didn't have a great system for accounting for it. If we're doing any type of, anytime we're collecting money within the district, there's a form uh, to fill out through the treasurer's office, I don't have it in front of me, but um, they need two weeks advance notice, so the, the building administrator principal signs off on it, sent over to the treasurer's office. So anytime we collect money, we need to let the treasurer's office know that we're doing that, but I wouldn't touch it personally. If it's a fundraiser, kids are selling gift cards, have them turn that money into the boosters. Let the boosters handle booster money. Um, your job is to create a great program for uh, the students and the boosters are to support you with that vision. I think having a, a strong partnership with the boosters. Uh, sometimes also boosters, when they don't get, they, they make fundraising seem like it's mandatory for the kids and sometimes they'll want to have you let the kids know that if they don't participate, they can't play. But participation in the fundraising piece can't be something that you hold against the student for playing time. Sometimes that people get you know, caught up in that. Also, like turning in, uh, pick like a uniform that maybe the boosters paid for, and if they don't turn it in, um, then they'll, they'll want to keep students out of activities. You can't do that. So I would just start, just think about the money, it's booster money, and you can help them uh, in terms of how you support the students, athletes, but you don't want to touch the money. Um, again, uh, 
you know, I wouldn't, do not, uh, you know, drink alcohol on a team event. And I know it sounds kind of funny, and again, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but if you went out for dinner and your team's on a team trip and you're at uh, Disney, um, and the boosters say, hey, I can, uh, we'll, we'll watch the kids tonight, you guys can go out for dinner, and uh, a couple well-intentioned coaches go out, and they have a glass of wine, you come back, and somebody has mentioned that, and you end up losing your job. So I think, um, you know, making sure, and sometimes I, I think through clubs, it becomes more common practice, potentially, like in an overnight, people are in the lobby, and some of those things. You wanna make sure that you separate yourself from any of that, because, um, your job is to supervise the, the students, and you can't ever abdicate yourself of that responsibility when you're on a team trip as the club advisor or the, um, the coach. Watch what you post on social media, because the kids and their parents will look through anything that you have. So uh, make sure that it's secure or anything you put out there. Sometimes you hear that, there's, well, it's my own personal beliefs. Well, if, if it's something that um, is going to create controversy within your program or doesn't paint you in a positive light, they will use that, parents will use that, and you will end up having to defend that. So just think about what you put on your social media accounts and with your assistant coaches. Uh, make sure that you'd want, that would be something that you'd want to share because uh, it will be out there. People will find it. Um, be careful what you share with your students you know, about yourself personally and what you do with your free time because they're kids and parents will tell you that they don't want all of the adult things on their, their kids' shoulders. And, they, and so sometimes that gets, especially younger coaches, into trouble talking about what they, you know, did on the weekend and they're in pretty close age to some of the older kids in the high school and, and that ends up getting people uh, into a jam. Uh, social, emotional wellness something that we're talking a lot about in the district and and every one of you will get a copy of this book uh, through your athletic director so we're purchasing th purchasing them for all of our teachers classified staff and any of you that don't work in the district outside of coaching um, i will purchase this for you through the athletic directors uh, so talking about student safety and student wellness um, our duty is to help students understand you know, appropriate language. So you get into when you hear and see any type of bullying, harassment, intimidation, inappropriate language, um, you, gotta, you have to address it. Because if you don't, um, students will think that you condone it. So uh, you have an opportunity uh, through the athletic code. Um, the drug and alcohol piece, you play a huge role in sending a positive message. And, Kids will say a lot of things in front of their coaches, but make sure that when you have those teachable moments that you take them. I think you also have a great influence in terms of like homecoming prom and some of those things, saying, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop by and just see you guys. You don't have to be the, the principal carrying the weight of the dance, but I've seen a lot of coaches over the years that drop by for the first half hour and they see their student athletes. It's a great way to see them, but it also sends the message that coach is there um, and, and just paying attention to those things. So um, you are a great role model. Uh, and I think at the end, protecting a positive culture within your program. And uh, again, we're very proud of the work that you do for our district. We want to say thank you. Take care of yourself because you're taking care of our students. Um, and if you ever have any questions, I'd be happy to help. I work closely with the ADs, so I think that's a good logical place to funnel up any questions, concerns, but I'd be happy to help you as well, and I appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to shift gears a little bit, but continue. Mr. McDonald, we appreciate your time and your message. One of the things uh, this summer, I was coming to school to work with some young kids. I was driving down Emerald Parkway. Students already know this. And magical things happen to me on Emerald Parkway. I don't know what it is. Um, but something always happens. And this summer day, I was coming down Emerald Parkway. And the story, I was listening to NPR. And they were talking about this particular mama duck and the 70 ducklings that were behind it. And although the story has grown and changed and moved on and whatever the case might be, when I first heard the story this summer, I thought, wow, this is what's happening 
with the young people that I'm working with, this is what's happening with a lot of you. And the story went on to talk about this one duckling that's in the front. Some of you are thinking, holy crow, that one mama had all those babies. No, that's not the case. But that one mama took in her own ducklings and a lot of others. And she led the way to show and teach and gather all those that didn't have someone to guide them. And when I was talking with the young kids this, uh, this summer, and while I share this story with you, it's a long story, but you don't want to hear the whole thing. But one of the things that makes an impact on who you are today and with the young people that I'm fortunate enough to work with is you lead the way for our young people. We have no control over who they go home to, although sometimes we wish we did. We have no control over the messages that they go home to. But sometimes one of the greatest things that each and every one of us do, and if you look real close, you can even see the mama carrying a couple on her back. We throw them on our back. We say, come on, let's go, and you lead the way. And for that reason, I'm grateful for the young people that do that. I'm grateful for each and every one of you. Now, Mr. McDonald said one of the things that we can't do is on a rainy day like this today and we're driving and we're going, holy crow, is that Johnny walking in the rain? Back in the day, we could throw them in the car, gently, put them in the car. <laughs> now, you know, I don't, you're, you're picturing it. That probably happened to you when growing up, right? Someone threw you in the car, right? It wasn't any of us, okay? We could do that. Now, we have to find different ways to be able to make sure we keep our young people connected, carrying them on our back with the expectations and the boundaries that each and any, every one of us are expected to do. And regardless of what those messages are, regardless of that they get when they go home, regardless, we are responsible to set those boundaries and expectations with the young people we work with in our clubs and on our sports teams. I've invited two young people to share with you tonight their insights, their expectations, their dreams, and whatever it is that they want to share with you in a few minutes' time. I'm fortunate enough to work along with actually Kathy Litzinger, who's here today. Um, we work with our Teen Institute group and the Dublin Act. And I've asked for them to come and share. And some of you may have heard them over the summer. They spoke to our coaches and um, meet the coach night. And they'd be happy to do that with you. So two people that are here with us today out of a larger group, I have Lily Shepard and Maddie Mayer, who are actually um, co-leaders, and Maddie's our president for Teen Institute here at Kaufman. But it, that doesn't mean that we don't invite Sayota and Jerome. They just couldn't be here tonight. Mm -hmm. So with that, I, I've invited them to come and talk with you a little bit, share their insight, and uh, talk with you a little bit about what they think is important from a perspective of a student that they wanted to be able to share with you. Hi, I'm Lily Shepard. I play soccer for Kaufman. I'm also part of Teen Institute. I'm an ambassador for Dublin Youth Council, and I also go to Youth to Youth things. Hi, I'm Maddie Mayer. I'm president of Teen Institute. I play volleyball for Kaufman, and I'm also a member of ACT Coalition. So I'm not gonna lie, being a student athlete and a leading member of a club is hard. There's no question about it. Playing high school sports and being actively involved in the club is a highlight of many teenagers' high school experience and one that's important to have. Sometimes, though, it's easy to lose focus on what is truly important, an individual's health. Unfortunately, injuries happen. Recovering from an injury can be a long, tedious process that is easy to want to speed up. Many teenagers are prescribed opioid prescription painkillers to aid in their recovery and rehabilitation. These drugs can quickly become a larger issue if a student comes to rely on them. As a coach, one of your biggest responsibilities is to remind your athletes that injuries happen, but that they will not be permitted to return until they are back to their A game. Your support in the recovery process can help provide the reassurance students need that coming back from an injury without the continued use of prescription painkillers is possible. Another huge point to take into consideration is that all your athletes and club members are responsible for reporting substance abuse. Many students might be worried about routing their teammates or fellow club members out, but as a coach or advisor, it is your duty to emphasize the benefits and responsibilities of being a team. Being a coach or advisor is a hugely rewarding experience, but it also comes with a heavy burden. 
Remember, being a team can only be achieved by cooperation, support, accountability, and looking out for each other. To truly be at the top of your game, it takes teamwork and a healthy road to recovery. One of the things to help prevent problems before they even happen is setting a clear and consistent no-use message across the board. All coaches and clubs need, and club advisors need to set a no-use message where alcohol and other drugs are absolutely not permitted. Um, alcohol abuse can affect a student up to 14 days after the time that they drank. This will come across in school, in clubs, in sports, and it will affect their participation and performance. Um, by sharing this message, we're being consistent with the law, and we hope that you are too. One of the things to help keep this in place is to remember the word smart. Um, it means set limits with expectations and consequences, which stands, which is the S. The M is a clear and consistent no use message. The A is awareness, so know the dangers for yourself and others. The R is resources. You as a club or coach advisor can be a resource to your students to make sure that they aren't doing anything that could hurt them or prevent them from being healthy. The T is for talk. Take the time to talk to your participants, to know that you're there to listen and to not judge them and to support them in being healthy. One of the things that the school has in place to keep this, um, to keep students healthy is the extracurricular code. The code is used and signed by all participants of clubs and sports. It ensures that beha the behaviors will reflect well back on the school community and organization. If a player or participant is in violation of anything laid out in the code, then they get loss of participation um, and they get, have to go through an assistant program to help them. This is in place to keep your players healthy and to keep their performance at a game. Um, thank you for your time and we appreciate you listening to us. Student leaders, uh, young people like uh, Maddie and Lily are available, like I mentioned. Um, this fall, they already did a number of Meet the Coach nights, and they are scheduling them here for the winter. Um, for those of you that might be doing some spring sports, they are um, invited to be a part of it. They, will, they have a little 8 to 10 minute presentation, and they'd be happy to do that, So, it, if, just so you know. Also, they are available to be a part of a number of other leadership programs. We're really fortunate to be able to have these young people that can go out, represent each and every one of us in a really positive way, and certainly support your young people and continue to make some of those positive choices. So we feel very grateful to be able to have them. So a couple of things. Lily talked a lot about the code in a really short amount of time. It's been interesting. The last time I did this, I actually changed this entire presentation based on some things that had happened. I know they're all supposed to be the same. First round of this pr presentation happened in May, then we did two in August, and this one, and we'll do one more in February. So with that being said, for those of you, when you hear about the one in May, it will be for the following school year. That one was actually very packed. Well, one of the things that happened, and you know this, I read your evaluations, I read all of your evaluations. And one of the things that was very interesting is through August, I'm sorry, through the end of May, I could not believe the amount of different questions that were brought to my attention for our extracurricular code. So I want to make sure that when you leave here tonight, you really are very clear, and some of you are like, Dee, I already know this, and that's awesome. But what I've been shocked with is how many of us don't know some of the questions that I'm going to share with you, okay? So I don't want you to pull out the cheat sheet. I want us to just simply have a conversation, and the fact that we're here in the lecture hall really opens to that. So I might repeat some of the questions, because we, we want to make sure if uh, anyone's watching this at a later date, they can hear your questions. But this is what I'm going to do. These are some questions that have been asked of me regarding the extracurricular code. Now, and I want to see if you can answer them. All right? I tried really, really hard to do this like on a, an app, like you push the button on your phones, because some of you are on your phones right now and you could have fooled me, like I'm working on it, I know what I'm doing, some of you are doing different things, grading papers, I get that, but I really tried to do it like on the, an app, so some of you that are really good at this, 
you could help me, <laughs> we'll work on it together. But with that being said, I couldn't figure it out. Spent way too much time trying to do it. So let's, let's tell me what you know about the code. Question number one. All right. You might just want to figure out where we all are on this one. Here's question number one. Now, is the code in season or all year round? All right, so for those of you that say it's just in season, let me see your hands. How many of you say it's all year round? Just want to make sure you're awake. All right, <laughs> now you know what? That's funny. You all raise your hand. Some of you are like, I don't know. Some of you just read it real quick beforehand. I want us to treat it like it's all year round. I want us, when we have our conversations with our young people, whether it's a club or whether it's a uh, sport, that you share with them that it's 365 days, 24 seven. I can't tell you how many young people that I have the opportunity to hang out with on a Monday night because they've made an, a, um, a choice over the summer that say, I didn't think that July 4th party would be a problem. 365, 24-7. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to give young people a reason to make a positive choice all year round. We, as the advisors and the coaches, need to make sure they understand that. Number two, if I have a student with an offense, will I be notified? Will you? Should be. You're like, I've been notified more than once. I guess we are all notified, right? <laughs> now, you should be invited if there's a code meeting. If a young person's violated the extracurricular code, you should be invited to the opportunity to be a part of that meeting. Sometimes you can't because of when your class periods are, OK? But we will provide a sub for you to be a part of that. Most of our young people do try to have that conversation with you beforehand. At least we invite them to make sure that they have that private conversation before the letter is sent to you. And while we're sitting there, and if you're not there, and we find out that they haven't had that conversation with you, we do ask that they have that conversation with you personally. Because we do think it's important that you understand and that you know the situation that might have happened. So if you're not notified for whatever reason, what has happened on occasion is maybe something I'm just, I'm just picking July 4th. I could say the Irish Fest. I could say a football game. I could say anything. But I'll just say for a summer event, like the Irish Fest, for example. Some young people, if they have a spring sport, might find another sport in between. We do try to make sure that you are very much aware consistently across the board if a young person's violated our extracurricular code. Number three, can, <clears throat> can someone with the code violation be captain of my team or an officer in my club? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? This is the way our code works, so you know. <clears throat> if I am on a sports team, and it's my first offense, 365 days, I've lost the opportunity to be captain or an officer in your club. So if I get, uh, if I violate the code, um, if I violated the code last weekend with Halloween, Okay, it's 365. So depending on when my sport or my club is, I've lost that opportunity. I've given it up. If it's my second code violation, I've given it up forever. I can't be president. I can't be, um, I can't be a captain. And I gotta tell you, that was created by the young people who put this code together this code has been reviewed over and over again, and it's been young people that fight for that particular situation. Because when it happens, that may be one of the greatest consequences. And they don't think about it until they're sitting in that meeting. On July 4th, they're at the Irish Festival, perhaps when they invite themselves to be, spend time with us. They do think about you. They're like, oh my God, you're not going to tell the school, are you? You're not going to tell my coach, are you? How about, you know, is the school going to find out about this? But they don't think about the captain until they're sitting in that meeting or when they have that conversation with you. 
They don't think about the loss of being president until they meet you and meet those eyes. Make sure they understand that. It'd be nice if they thought about it beforehand. It would. We've got to figure out a way to make that happen. If a student talks with me about his or her use, am I obligated to share this information with someone? What do you think? Talk to me. What do you think? Unless you're a lawyer. Unless you're a lawyer. Go ahead. Somebody else said something. Am I obligated? It's an interesting conversation, and I talked uh, about this beforehand. If you're a school counselor or in a position that you have an opportunity to have a private conversation with an individual, then no. Rules are different. If you're a captain or a captain, sorry. If you're um, a coach or a club advisor and someone has a conversation with you and talks with you about it, that's one of the reasons why we have the code. If they haven't had a prior situation, we use that as a voluntary referral and provide them the opportunity, the education, and the support that they need to be able to move forward. Does that make sense? Without judgment. There isn't any room for judgment from any of us. Keep that in mind. Number five, what if I, we kind of talked about this, uh, what if my student is involved in a violation over the summer? Will this interfere with my sport or club? Please, please tell me the answer to that, would it? Yes. Thank you, okay. Um, how, if at all, are parents involved in the code? Someone tell me. They have to sign. Now that doesn't mean they can't drink if they're over 21. You know that, right? I'm just checking. OK. All right. How else are our parents involved? Somebody, talk to me. Providing the alcohol? Now our hope is that our parents do not provide the alcohol. But if they do, it does happen, unfortunately. But the majority do not. Right. Even if, they do provide it at their home. if they provide it at their home, if they provide it at their home, um, let me make sure I understand it. Talk to me some more. What are you saying? What's that? Happened to one of your kids? Did you did you understand that? So if I post something, if I'm hosting the party, I'll just use myself instead of anybody in the audience, because people have said I pick on them. <laughs> like I could pick on Kathy, but I won't. But if I'm the one who's hosting the party, and I have a picture with my son or daughter, and I'm smoking a cigar or having an alcoholic beverage, and it's there, that's a code violation. Was, I, was this person in the picture with them? No, With his dad, right. Smoking it. Oh, the kid had one also. Okay, making sure I was clear. Mm -hmm. 18th birthday. Celebrating, went viral. Okay, right. Right. So, legally, legally, a parent can serve their child an alcoholic beverage. For extracurricular code, they cannot. Did I see someone have their hand up? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If someone self-refers, who do we report that to? You can report it to your athletic director. You can report it to an assistant principal. You can report it to me. Okay. Um, if it's a code, if it's a club member. Um, it's probably easier to report it to me. If you're at Jerome or if you're at Kaufman, it's easier probably to consistently report it to me. If you're at um, Scioto or the Bridge, it's easier to report it to Carly George. But athletic director is always available. Assistant principals are also always available. Not that you can't talk about it with your principal, but to refer that. Okay. All right. One other piece with the with the parents. If my son or daughter has a code violation. They are, the parents are invited to the code meeting. 
okay? Then they are expected to also join their son or daughter to be eligible. A parent has to participate in the education series. So whether parents like it or not, and they don't always like it, they're expected to be a part of the eight-hour education program on Monday evenings, although one series is on Tuesdays this year. Okay? Questions? All right. Let's see. Mm, is drug testing part of our program? Yes or no? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? How many of you are like, oh, I'm not really sure about that one? Let me, let me make sure you walk out here knowing that. Okay? Because some of you, how many of you went to Dublin City Schools? Oh, look at that. It's so cool. How many of you, when you went here, um, we had random drug testing for all athletes? We do not have it like that anymore. And there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not that will come back or not come back. There's some reasons why we don't have that, and if you want to hear the quick and dirty of it, one of the reasons why we don't have it, financially it was huge, okay? But also with that, we found that there was an increase in alcohol use, as if we need an increase in alcohol use. But what happened was young people were worried that marijuana would show up, and so they found a way to drink. Well, they always find ways to drink. But they drank much more than they did before because they thought that, you know, one hour they could get away with it with one hour of drink um, getting out of their system. Uh, that's number one. Number two. We do have drug testing for a part of our program for a young person who has violated our code. So if I violated their extracurricular code, drug testing would be uh, random, I'd be part of the random drug test up to three times. So that is the answer to that. It's not a trick question, but in case anyone ever asks you, drug testing is part of our program. Up to three times the school board will pay for it. If parents want it more, we do have a partnership with SportSafe and they can actually have that be a part of, their pro, um, part of the parent part. We won't know it. But if it comes up positive, they test it twice, they will call the parents and then they call me and it's considered a second code violation. Okay? Questions? How many of you would like drug testing back for, for everybody? A couple of you? Others like, I'm not really sure. There's so many things I want to say right now, but I want to get you out of here on time. Now, this is interesting. What percent of a season or sport will a student gain if they choose not to use? Anybody? See, I like you sitting in the front row. What percent? 100%. It was just checking. All right. But you know what? That's the way we can frame it for our young people. A lot of times they feel like they don't get any benefits from making these good choices. They do. We constantly talk about this being an honor and a privilege to be a part of our sports teams and a part of our clubs. Allow them to realize by making the positive choices, they get to continue to participate. Now, we also hear about the young people who choose to use and still don't get caught. It's a constant work in progress, isn't it? It is. It's a challenge. I know it's a challenge for me, and you are the front line, so you hear it way more than I do. And I hear a lot. Question, I don't know what number one. Here we go. Most of you know this one. Most of you know this one. What percent of a season or sport will a student lose if they choose to use? What about first defense? How much? Look at that. You all know that because it affects you all so personal. Doesn't it? When I'm your number one point guard, go ahead, picture it. <laughs> go ahead. You wouldn't be the center. <sighs> oh my gosh. You couldn't hear that. But you're so true. I just said today, if I, uh, he said I wouldn't be center. I wouldn't. And I wanted to be this, the starting point guard at any college that would have taken me, but that didn't happen. All right. But you know that because that affects you, and it affects what's happening on the court, on the field, in the pool in your clubs, that's the first thing that comes out of our mouth. Are you ready to miss 20%? Not you, I mean, you felt like I was picking on you, didn't you? I'm not, 
Okay. What about second percent? What is it? 50 percent. 50 percent. We talk about that. When we have our, our meetings and we sit around and we talk about this with our uh, meet the coach night, that's what we talk about. If you make this choice, you're going to be sitting out 20 percent. If you've already sat out, it's going to be 50. And then what do we say about the third offense? You're done. Three strikes and you're done. But what happens if you don't have any? 100% on that field. 100% in that water. 100% sitting there having that opportunity. We talk about that one all the How about self-referral? How much time do I lose if I make a voluntary or self-referral? We call it all kind of things. What's that? First self-referral. You only get one. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to let you know last weekend, yeah, well, the, the weekend before, too, and, and one more time. Yeah, one more time. <laughs> How many more do I get? One time can you volunteer a referral. And if you do voluntarily referral the first time without the police involved, You have the opportunity to participate in the education series, and you also have the opportunity to participate in the drug testing program. But you also have the opportunity to hopefully learn and grow. Now, we've had young people who have tried to call or text you right away when they've been involved in a situation with the police. Hey, coach, just wanted you to know I decided to voluntarily refer myself. First question out of your mouth needs to be, were the police involved? Because the truth is, we get the report. We do. We get the list. So we have to be consistent and let them know that if the police were involved, it's considered a first offense. If they've had a first offense, they've lost the opportunity to voluntarily refer. It becomes an automatic second offense. And if I, if I, this is important, you guys. If I voluntarily referred or self-referred myself, the second offense, the second time I get caught, is what? It's 50%. It's considered a second violation. So we really want to wrap those kids around and make sure that they understand it's an honor and a privilege now, with this being said, I want you to understand that Dublin Schools has invested a ton of energy and time and recently hired another person to be able to help navigate this journey. Carly George has recently been hired. Her position is to work with higher level, more challenging young people with the Tier 4. So if I have a young person who I'm even worried about being involved in a second offense, we're going to do everything we possibly can to be able to help navigate him or her in a way to be able to have a much healthier journey. If you're worried about someone, let's not wait until they get caught with a, with a situation. Let's do what we can beforehand. Let's put things in place to be able to support him or her to be able to navigate the rest of the way through high school and hopefully then through college or through whatever their journey may take them after high school. If a student refuses to participate in the student assistance program, can they participate in my sport or club? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? You guys can't see, but in the back row, they're all waiting to see what you guys say. <laughs> all waiting. They see you raise it. They know you're, you're like straight A students right here, right here in the front. I've never been accused of that. Never been accused. <laughs> Me neither, just like I wanted to be the point guard. All right. <laughs> Student assistance program, if I refuse, Halloween weekend, if I got caught, that means I am not, I'm not eligible for one calendar year. One calendar year if I refuse. If I refuse the education, if I refuse the drug testing, if I refuse all that goes with it, one calendar year I'm not eligible. 
All right. Whoops. What if my student, oh, someone brought this up. I, these are all questions that were asked of me. I'm not making this up. If, um, if my student had the party at his or her house and alcohol was served, but he or she did not drink, is this a code violation? So I'm, how, I'm, I'm having the party at my house, but I want to make sure that I'm sober so I can manage all of you that come over. <coughs> is that a code violation? <coughs> This is where you're supposed to answer. It's a student party. I'm not really having a party. Student party, you're supposed to get out of there. Student party. I'm hosting it. Is it a code violation for me? Allow me to share. This one is confusing, and it has changed within the last couple of years. Most people are aware of the adult social host law, right? They don't always consistently um, hold our parents accountable when there's a party. But if we know of a party, and we had one this year, where a young person hosted a party, he actually also partaked. But if I'm hosting a party, and I provide alcohol, whether I'm drinking or not, it's considered a, a code violation. So much so, because I'm hosting the party and I was providing it for all of you, it's one year out for me. So some of you are thinking, oh, so you might as well drink. That's not what we're trying to promote. <laughs> I forgot I was being recorded. Cut that part out, OK? We want to make sure that the person who's hosting, as well as everybody at the party, is choosing not to use. But if I'm hosting the party, even going to lengths where I'm choosing not to use, I am now responsible for all of you that may come to my house, whether I like it or not. Just like the parents, if they are home or not home, and it's my house, they should be held accountable without question. But we can't control what the police do. But if I am charged, I am held responsible, it's serving, it's a year out for me. So please make sure your young people understand that. They made a good choice by not drinking, but you're hosting the party at your house. Be careful. How does that work if you're not supplying the alcohol, but it ends up at your party? Great question. What happens if I'm having the party, and I want to make sure that you all come, and I even told you not to bring it? Don't bring it. This is a you know, drug-free party. Don't come. You know, D, she doesn't drink. She doesn't use. She doesn't do anything. Don't bring it. I won't point to you. You decide to uh, bring the alcohol, and you come to my house, and you bring it. You make sure you tell your kids. If that happens, you tell the parents. You call the police, and you get them out. Kick them out. Party's over. Someone brings alcohol. You have to take responsibility for that. Now, you can't come in. I would come in, and I'd have a conversation with you as my coach, make sure that they know it, even if the police were not involved. That would not be considered a code violation at that moment if you handled it in that way. If it gets out of hand, not if it gets out of hand. If anyone stays with it and you did nothing with it, it's a code violation. Good question. All right, what if I receive a picture or a video of my student drinking or using? Is that a code violation? Yeah. It is. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, people will say in a solo cup, <laughs> it was one hand's a beer and the other hand's a solo cup. Somebody, like Kathy's holding a beer and I'm holding a solo cup. Then you're at a party. As a coach or an advisor, you have that opportunity, although it does not say anywhere in our policy that we cannot be at a party where there's alcohol. It does not say that. At one point, it did. Our current code does not say. Probably those of you that had drug testing when you were here, it was part of that. Do you remember that? That was a nightmare for me because I'd get a picture, and if one beer, 20 kids, you look familiar. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Um, it would be, it was really difficult. And we were trying to be clear and consistent with our message. 
You as the leader of your organization has the right to say, if you're at that party, you get your butt out. It's not written in our code that way. You can handle it in any way you want. But if there is a picture and I'm holding a beer, if I'm smoking a cigar, if I'm drinking or using the jewel, if something smoky looking like is coming out of my mouth, we have to address it as a code violation. I'll say, that wasn't me, my twin sister. Think about it. Jeweling, part of our code. How many of you do not, does anybody not know what a jewel is? Okay, anybody? A jewel is the latest and greatest thing that's out there for our young people. It's vaping, it looks like a flash drive. How many of you have seen them? Yeah, picked them up, passed them off, thought, oh my goodness, I didn't realize what that was, right? Um, there's a lot that's going on with the jewel right now. It is part of our extracurricular code. It's a substance. They're actually changing the policy to make sure that they're using the word um, jewel just because we have so many young people who are choosing to use it. Whether it's on school property or off school property, it is considered a code violation. It's one of the most challenging things that I've taken on in my career, in addition, early in, in this piece. Substance use at a later is a much different challenge, but having young people understand that the jewel is dangerous, it's, uh, the consequences long term have not been yet identified, it is against our extracurricular code. If we can help young people not start, that's probably the greatest thing. The amount of nicotine allows them to quickly become addicted. And just so you know, exactly like I've said in the past, THC is going to be the next thing that's in it. It is. We've already had a number of jewels that we've had the opportunity to confiscate. THC has been a part of it. Okay? So it looks like they're just jeweling and that we are overreacting. If you ever walk into a kid's restroom around here and you see like six feet in the, in the stall and a puff of smoke that's coming out, they're jeweling. Okay? Now we don't know if it's nicotine or if it's THC. We treat it all the same. Um, what if my student was charged with the police and um, that did not include a substance? Is that a code violation? Yeah. Yes, it is. It's our citizenship piece. It's a first offense. If I was caught uh, at the Irish Fest for drinking and then I was arrested for uh, shoplifting or whatever the case might be, that would be considered a second violation. Citizenship is anything that brings dishonor to your sports team or to your club. Um, what if my student was a designated driver uh, and did not drink, got pulled over uh, with a student in the car with alcohol or other substances? Is this a code violation? Hold on one second. Go ahead, here we go. Let's listen. Wait, we have someone right here that wants to make a comment. What if the student was actually trying to do the right thing and get a student home safely and was stopped? It's a really tough thing. I don't know if you could hear it for the purposes. So I'm trying to do the right thing. My friends call me. I'll get you. My friends call me and uh, they say, you know, I've been drinking. Will you come and get me? I'm sober. I'll go pick them up. They're trying to do the right thing. I get pulled over. How do I handle that? Were you going to say something about that? Is, there's a difference if there is a substance in the car or if there isn't, right? If yes. there is, then you're responsible for it because you're driving. But if there isn't a substance and you just have a drunk friend, then you're fine, right? Yes. So, <laughs> so a lot of things I want to say. But you're right. That's the difference. Did you hear that? Now, it's really hard. We're talking to high school kids. We're talking to high school kids. And the drinking age is what? What is it? Okay. And the legal age for marijuana use? And the crowd goes wild, trying to figure that out. <laughs> I 
I'm really scared about what's coming with marijuana. But it is a substance that is already here. Regardless of what they tell me, it's natural, it's an herb, it's something safe, you really are overreacting, D. You've heard me say that before. When they say it's natural, it's, you know, it's a plant. I just tell them to go roll in some poison ivy over there and you tell me. <laughs> it's natural. It's a plant. God gave it to us. Go roll in it. Oh, no, no, don't roll. Because that means something separate. Doesn't mean it's safe. For purposes of this question, you said it correctly. If I'm a high school student, if I'm a high school student and I am called and I go pick them up, this has happened before. You've heard me say this. Someone in a very high leadership position in one of our schools thought that they were doing the right thing, going to pick up somebody. When he turned around and asked the kid in the back, God, don't throw up in my mom's car, he swerved. I'm not sure if those were the exact words, but he swerved. Cops pulled him over. What he didn't know was that there was a substance in the vehicle. And he was charged. In a pretty high-profile drug-free club. Thought he was doing the right thing. Was he? In a lot of ways, we could defend him, couldn't we? The way our code is written, the way the law was written, he was charged with possession. When you get the police report, when you get the police report, and it says possession because he was the one that was driving, we had no choice but to run it like a code. So when we're talking to our young kids, how do we provide, I'll get you, when we're talking to our young kids who are not 21, if they're 21, and they're still part of our clubs, they're probably a part of our special ed group, okay? And we provide a, a clear and consistent no-use message with them as well. We want them to be a part of our clubs, we want them to be a part of our groups. But even with that being said, 21 or not, if they're a part of our clubs and they're part of our sports teams, they don't have the opportunity to drink. How do we present this in a way where we can make sure our young kids are safe. How do you do that? How do you provide a clear and consistent no-use message but still make sure that they get home safe? Don't put it in your car. Okay, what else? Call what? Call the parents. That's one way. And it's hard to do, isn't it? Now you, didn't, you may not have heard that. Call an Uber. We've had a lot of young people call Ubers. So, I want you to picture this. You're my sports team. And I'm talking to you. And I just got done talking to you about how important it is to make positive choices. And to be clean and you get to participate 100% of the time. And then if I say something and say call Uber, if you've made a choice, What am I doing unintentionally? Yeah. And I can only tell you what our kids tell me and what our surveys have shown us. If we give a mixed message, the unintended consequence is that we're giving them permission to use. It's tricky. It's tricky. So what you said was absolutely accurate. What you said was absolutely accurate. One of the things that I'm telling you young people want us to do this is to be very clear with the expectation, to be very clear with the boundaries. Alcohol, there's no room for alcohol. You're breaking the law, right? It's not only part of my team rules, my club rules. Oh, it's against the law. And it's probably, hopefully, against your parents' expectations as well. We can't control that. But we can be very clear in what we say and how we say it to our young people. If you care about somebody and they call you in the middle of the night, take a parent with you. Let the parent drive. You go ahead and go with them. Oh, they're going to love that. But you know what? If we're really worried about the safety of our young people, then make, we have to encourage them to be able to do that. They don't have to call us the next day and say it's a code violation, but we do want them to get home. 
Does the same rule apply if they're driving their parent home? See, every year I get one of those questions. <laughs> right here. You know what? I, don't, I, I can guess what the answer is to that, but I don't want to. If I'm driving my parents and I get pulled over, I have my parent in my car, it's their car, I'm sober, I think the parent, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I think I'm going to put it on my parents. That's a great question. I would put it on my parents. I know that happened. It did, and was it on the parents? Or was it on the, oh, okay. It's happened at some point, I'm sure. Hold on one sec. Oh, wait, wait. I'm, don't, let me get you in a minute, but I promised you. Do you remember what it was? See, when I'm my age, I am grateful I remembered you. That's the biggest problem I have with the code, is how black and white it is. And I've wasted it, I've said it, and I won't say that to the kids in front of my wrestlers, but I will say that in this meeting. The biggest problem I have with the code is how black and white it is. There's absolutely zero gray room for an incident, as we talked about, or the one you, the examples you get, even though it was in the car, swerved, did the right thing, went and picked up friends, and did those things. They already had the ministry. Who pays people over hundred thousand dollars a year to make decisions and do these things, but yet it's written in black and white? Hell, I could hire a monkey to do that. That's the truth. That's the way I believe. It. That's why I have a huge problem with it. So let me make sure you've heard this, and I appreciate that. Uh, I mean, it's not. Yep. I'm just, just being honest. I would uh, never ever say that in front of her. Right. You know, we, we abide by the code, and that's what we have to live by, those set of rules that we have to live by. However, we, we employ people to make decisions and to look at these situations, read into them, investigate them, and make a call, in my opinion. But this doesn't allow that. This is black and white. I can type it into a computer and say, ah, code violation, send him off. Well, I... I what you, and, and what I want to make sure you hear, because I want to make sure everybody understood this, and especially since we're being recorded, the challenge is the black and white of the, the code. And, and with that being said, I understand that and I feel for you. Um, when it's on a police report, we have, to, we have to abide to what the police report states. If it comes to us in a different way, then I think we do have some flexibility, whether we want to call it gray, or, um, you know, that movie Gray has really, uh, you know what I'm talking about? We got pick a, whether it's purple or uh, green, um, we, we might have the opportunity to have a conversation and engage, especially for some of those young kids who we clearly know, especially in that situation. Um, but we also, we try to do what we can to be consistent. Well, I, I like what you said about flexibility, I don't, I don't I've seen it too. aren't involved and the administration immediately goes to verbiage or goes to this code instead of making an intelligent decision on what happened and, and how it happened and where they are and what that particular student athlete needs. Does that student athlete need 50 percent taken away? Whatever it is. Sure. That particular scenario. Is that the right thing for that student at that time? That's why I have a problem with code. You know, that, for instance, my, I gave you the example earlier where my kid is 18 years old, he's out with his parents. You know, his parents back him in the code meeting saying, look, he's with me, I handed it to him, he's 18 years old. Should they post online? Is that stupid? Yeah. Yeah, it's stupid. Is it, not, is, it, is it against the law? No, it's not. It wasn't against the law, he was 18 years old. And that was their fight. And, and, well, it is a code that they signed. It's black and white in this case. And the parents are in there vouching for it. Now, parents could also be vouching for the alcohol down in the basement, too. So I sure. put it every situation. Sure. Now, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with the parent in that situation. 
for the alcohol. The point is, I think that the administrators are hired to do a job, and, and they keep falling into this instead of making an intelligent decision. And I don't think that's fair to the student athletes, parents, coaches, or it, it, I don't think it helps the health of our kids moving on because we haven't made an intelligent decision about them. We've, we've only gone off the piece of paper. But, and I appreciate it. And I know you've written, um, assuming you, maybe others have written that too. Uh, you know, when it, when it, our code is black and white in a lot of different ways, and it is difficult sometimes, what we do try to do is try to provide the best supports that we can. Situations like that, I hear you. I hear you. And um, sometimes, like your hands are tied, so are mine. And so I have to... Um, I appreciate the efforts that a lot of our administrators try to do to be consistent uh, so that no one comes back on us otherwise, but it is a work in progress and we are, um, I just talked with Tom today and said, let's have a meeting. I feel like we need to review the code again uh, because I think, you know, how can we continue to find a way to be able to support our young people in making positive choices, hold them accountable and not um, deter them from growing and learning. So I appreciate what you said. Yeah. See, welcome. I'm so happy. Oh, okay. So to, to your point, uh, where it says, you know, charge of the police defense. Yeah. Um, and you said the guy was charged with possession. He or she. Yeah. Is that, so you have to police report and you make that decision. Are you not waiting for if it's dismissed, then um, it's dismissed. But we will, we get the report pretty quickly. We do. Within a month, we get it. We will run it. Um, and if it's dismissed, and there's a lot of, you know, there, it hasn't happened often. There have been times um, in my career that it may interfere with your sport or your club. Um, Usually what, what typically will happen is the student will um, admit that there might have been additional situations, so we go with the opportunity to educate and move them forward. But if it's eliminated from the courts, um, then it, in my career, I can only think of maybe one time where it's been eliminated from the courts. And I've been here longer than some of you guys have been born. How sad is that? <laughs> Look at you. So, Thank you. So the one, that's my question. The one question I did have, let's see yeah. the student that came up and said, hey, you know, I got in a fight over the weekend. You know, and, and so he's kind of like self-referring, but I, I know it's his code about like drugs and whatnot, but I'm talking about violence, so. But sure. There's no police report. Right. You know, I think that, that's a great question, too. So if you couldn't hear it, I um, was in a fight with somebody else in another district. It got to my AD. Um, that really, you know, when it's not on a police report, we do have a little bit more flexibility. Do we handle it as a volunteer referral? I, I think you address it. I don't think you have to refer, you know, you don't have to address it as a first offense but you definitely want to address it, hold them accountable, and you have some flexibility. If they're on a police report, we, we don't have much flexibility. We really don't. That's a good question. All right, let me keep going. Is that all right? If you think of something, all right. Uh, let's see. Does my student still have the opportunity to earn a letter uh, or an award if they have a violation? Yes, they do. They do. Only if they've completed all that are expected. If they've completed the education series, if they sat out their 20%, if they participated in the uh, education, uh, drug testing, et cetera, uh, yes, they do. Some coaches will hold on to the letter until they've completed the education series. Got it? All right. Uh, is prescription pills part of the code? What if my uh, student, if you guys don't know the answer to this, I'm going to be a little concerned, uh, shared his or her prescription pills with another student. Is that a code violation? Yes. I'm just telling you, someone asked me that. So, be very clear. 
None of us in this room, on our sports teams, or in our clubs, in this building, or anywhere can share our prescription pills with anyone. It's a felony. As a coach or club advisor, is it okay to share my old stories growing up? When back in the day, you guys are laughing and you're like, is that okay? I mean, I did that last week. Is it all right for me to share my stories? Drinking stories, maybe Drink. there's a good moral to it. <laughs> moral story, like I did this and was wrong and I got in trouble, so don't do it. Do you mind if I sure. build on that? <laughs> So the point was, so what if I share my story and then tell them why? Because the outcome was really bad. Do I share the story then? I'm not going to let anybody answer that. I'm going to answer it for you, all right? Because there's a lot of conversation that can go on with it. If I'm a drug-free kid and I hear you share that story, I'm going to say, well, of course, dude. That was like, why? Yeah. That's why I don't do it, right? And if I'm a kid who's kind of on that fence and don't know, I might walk away, I might walk away thinking, well, you're, you're the coolest coach I ever had, and you got caught, and there was a great outcome to that, or you know, a bad outcome. I want to make sure I don't get in that trouble. I might think that. If I'm a kid who's already using, I'm going to say, you are so stupid that you put yourself in that position where you got caught. That's why we have to realize it's best not to share it. Now, some of you may have already. Don't beat yourself up. It's just like, do I tell my kids? There's a lot of things we don't tell our kids. Lots of things. <laughs> Lots. But when it comes to alcohol and other drugs, we feel like we have to share that for some reason. We don't. Because what the kids say in that situation, even with the negative outcome that may have come with it, we're giving them permission to use. Because it's a mixed message. The no use message is all based on the research. It's not based on me. It's based on the research of our Dublin City School kids. You open that door, the unintended consequence is that we are giving them permission to use. So with that being said, let's really work hard and not go on down old memory lane. You can share whatever stories you want with each other, but let's not share them with our team members. Uh, am I obligated to go over the code with your team and sports club? Yes. If I'm concerned about um, a student, if you are concerned about someone and you're worried about them, I want you to know that, of course, you can always call me, your school counselor. We have um, S3s. Our support staff is available. You can always talk to your athletic director, your assistant principal. We'll help you get the help and the support you need. If you're worried, we should never allow a young person to go without support. How do you feel like you did on the code? I wish I had that little app to see the results. It would have been helpful. If you have any questions, if you have any concerns, please make sure that you do this. So let's move forward. Let's, let's try to get out of here. There's all kind of stuff that I had that I'm not going to do it. For us, what are the things that we know that we can do as we continue to move forward? The longer we can delay the onset, the longer we can delay the first time a young person puts alcohol to their lips, or smoke weed for the first time, the less likely they'll have problems in their adult life. A young person who starts drinking before the age of 15 has a four to five times greater chance of having a problem in their adult life with alcohol. They start smoking weed. This research has just recently come out. If we have a young person who's smoking weed under the age of 16, started smoking under the age of 16, they have a 17% chance of placing themselves at risk 
for using opioids. Am I saying that every young person who's smoking weed is going to be doing that? No. But that research, I think, is pretty important for us to wrap our head around. Their perception of harm when it comes to marijuana is, again, they really think we don't know anything. Because, you know, it's legal, D. When it becomes a prescription, we will share what the school district's expectations and rules are then. But for right now, it's not legal for any of us. And it's certainly not a prescription that's available to anyone. So with that being said, I'll continue to move on. Lily talked about setting limits, making sure we understand that, making sure we provide a clear and consistent no-use message. Please take the time to be aware of what's really going on. <coughs> she also said to take the time to talk. Not text. Take the time to talk like you do to the young people. Not only your sports teams, not only your clubs, take time to talk to each other. Put your phones away. It's an old fashioned thing. It is. It's an old fashioned thing that makes a lifetime impact once we really can find a way to be able to do it. Some things that I really wanted to share with you. What time is it? There's, there's a number of things that I want to be shared, share with you. When we talk about our code, when you get ready for a meeting, when you get ready for your season, when you get ready for a game, when you get ready for a match, when you get ready to teach, you put a plan of action in place. You don't walk out without knowing what you're going to teach. You don't walk into a meeting and not have some hope of what it is you hope to discuss. You don't go out there without a plan of action. And I'm begging you not to be fooled that when we're talking about substance use, that it's not one of the number one things that we need to invest more time in talking with our young people about. It should be as much of a priority as all the game plans that some of you have created while you've been sitting here. It should be just as important as the grocery list that you just created while you've been sitting here. It should be just as important as anything and everything that we do when we're talking with our young people. You know, we have to have a plan A and a plan B. Now this is crazy. I want you to take a look at this. The plan was to take the pipe from downtown Steubenville to out Route 7 and turn it around the corner and get it where it needed to be. Simple task, right? Go from point A to point B. Many of you know I'm from Steubenville. God love them, they're a work in progress. <laughs> Even coming from Steubenville. <laughs> Dean Martin was from Steubenville. <laughs> and so, so was I. Yeah. Nice but I didn't have enough inches to play point guard in any wow. college out there. Point A to point B. Lots of engineers talked about this easy process just like it is an easy process for you to be able to share the code. They couldn't cut this corner. Shut down the town for a very long time. Poor Steubenville, they were a work in progress all the time. Don't be fooled. It's not as simple as it is. There's a poem, I'm just gonna read a couple pieces of this poem to you. Why? Because when we're dealing with our young people, each and every one of us, when we get out of the car in the morning, if you work here at, your, at this building or any one of the buildings here in Dublin, when you get out of the car and you're fortunate enough to walk into our doors, and I do, I'm very blessed. I'm so blessed to be able to be a part of this family. But I gotta tell you, regardless of what's going on out there, when I come here, It's really important that I'm present. 
And so for me, when I clip on my name tag, when I clip it on, I make sure that I'm present in a way that I can be very present for the young people. And there's some days, I've got to be honest with you, it might be 9 o'clock and I still haven't clipped it on yet because I'm not ready because I might have some other stuff that's going on. Just like we fool our young people sometimes when we arrive and we have to put on our game day face, you know what I'm talking about? So are our young people. And I'm going to challenge you to think about this. And I read this poem and I've talked about, I read this poem with one of our highest achieving athletes. That if we would see him engaged in the activity that he is most successful with, you wouldn't know what's really going on in his heart. You wouldn't know the challenge that that person has to go with. And when we read this together, and I'm just only going to read a few lines of it, I want you to hear it. And I want you to think about the young people that we work with and how fortunate we are, but I also want you to realize they come with their own baggage as well. And your club and your sports team may be the only safe place that they have. And when I talked with that young person, that young person said, if I didn't have this sport, I don't know where in the heck I would be. But let me read this to you really quickly. I have to wear glasses now. Don't be fooled by me. Don't be fooled by the mask I wear. For I wear a mask and none of them are me. A mask that I'm afraid to take off, pretending as an art that's second nature to me. But don't be fooled. For God's sakes, don't be fooled. I give you the impression that I am secure and that all is sunny and unruffled with me as well as and without. The confidence is my name and coolness is my game and that I need no one. Please don't believe me. My surface may, say, may seem smooth, but my surface is my mask. Beneath me sm swells the real me in confusion, in fear, alone, and in pain. But I hide this. I don't want anybody to know it. I panic at the thought of my weakness, fears, and pain being exposed. That's why I frantically create a mask to hide behind. Some of you know who I'm talking about. Some of you are talking about you. I need help. Help that is followed by caring people, caring people just like you. It's the only thing that I can uh, liberate me from myself, from my self-built prison walls, for barriers that I so pakingly erect. So I play my game, my desperate game, with the mask of assurance without and the trembling child within. It goes on and on and on. Just like we wear our masks, so do our young people. Some of our most high achieving young people wear that mask because they're scared. If you know them in any other way, except for the most achieving, successful person, we may feel different about them. And some of those young people may be successful in your clubs and in your sports teams, and then they may find other ways to be able to cope with what's really going on. So many of you do a masterful job in taking them and helping them take those masks off. Some of the times they take the mask off and then you don't know what to do. That's where we're fortunate enough here in Dublin to be able to help you manage some of those young people. I want to encourage you to be able to continue to help young people take those masks off and encourage you that when you place your name tag on, you allow yourselves to think about each and every day, whether it's with your club or your sports team, how fortunate we are to have this as an opportunity to be present and purposeful, and that we all can hold each other accountable with an attitude that can help our young people continue to grow. There's just one last thing I want to be able to say, because I didn't get to half of the presentation that I want to be able to share with you. The district's been working really hard as a result of a Cardinal Health Grant that we received to be able to put a toolkit of educational pieces together. This toolkit is available to each and every one of us to have little snippets if we're talking to our sports teams, to our clubs, to our parents, whatever the case might be, where I can pull this little piece out to be able to help navigate this. And I'm just going to show you and let you know that we have this toolkit. It's available. We will be uh, unveiling it, like, soon. And you'll be able to share this and be able to have hardcore information easily available to you. 
It, it was originally <coughs> started as a result, of course, of part of the uh, opioid crisis. Cardinal Health gave a special permission to be able to include alcohol and other substances because they know that alcohol is the number one drug of choice for our young people. And they also know that we are dealing with perhaps one of the greatest things that's coming our way when it's coming to alcohol, the misuse of marijuana, and of course, prescription pills. You might see this somewhere. Where do you go from here? You know where to go from here. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your comments. I want to thank you for your ability to be able to speak openly and freely. If you have ideas and you want to, when we continue to work on the extracurricular code, share them with me, write them in your evaluation. I pull those out and I appreciate those comments. Thank you all so much.